All right, so we're gonna switch gears and talk about how, about PSMA targeted radiotherapy and the role of the urologist. And I think yesterday, Evan, you talked about PSMA, the vision trial and whatnot. I saw his slides and yeah, the guy's much smarter than I am and, and I think uh, he probably did that t topic more justice than I could. So we're gonna talk about briefly about vision. We're gonna talk about the therapy trial. We're gonna talk about changing disease states, clinical trials, and then finally conclude with some opportunities for urology practices. So this, you probably saw yesterday from Evan, the vision trial to me, I mean, it's, I'm biased, but from a nuclear medicine radiology perspective, it's probably one of the most important trials we've ever had in the history of nuclear medicine. And what it showed was great, that it actually had a significant improvement in overall survival in these patients who were really, really sick. These were patients who received multiple lines of therapy, and it had this wonderful response. So we have no doubt, even though I don't have the data to prove it, that patients who probably aren't as sick as we saw in this trial are gonna do even much better. Um, that being said, there's always sort of that reality, so we need to keep things in check. Uh, radiographic progression-free survival was also much better. Uh, and this has really sparked a ton of excitement throughout all of oncology. And it's been rare that a nuclear medicine trial has created so much excitement at ASCO, at GU ASCO, at e EAU, all the different uh, uh, meetings, which is great, because it's really about team-based cancer care. This trial, it's called the therapy trial. So this actually was released before the vision trial, and, and it's, it comes from Peter McCallum in Australia, in large part because Every other country in the world is much more advanced in this space than we are here in America. But that's okay, because we're gonna come back and we're gonna, we're gonna to, to sort of lead the way. Um, this trial compared lutetium-177 PSMA versus cabazitaxel head-to-head. And what it saw was that the PSA response rate of greater than 50% drop was significantly better in those patients who received PSMA compared to those who received cabazitaxel. So it really creates a compelling argument to use this in that post-docetaxel patient before uh, moving on to a, a, a different treatment. In that study, you know, a lot of people will talk about how they use multiple different imaging agents to really help select the patients that would best undergo this treatment. What I'm gonna tell you today is this is exciting. It's exciting for me. I don't think you need to worry about this. It gets sort of into some nuances and some, some complexities Personally, I think it's a little much to say, man, we're gonna to have to get two PET CTs in a patient just to figure out whether or not you're gonna get required, uh, eligible to receive this treatment. The logistics of it become complicated, the costs, you know, from a gross charges perspective, that might be fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. Our collection rates are gonna be a lot lower, obviously, but it's a significant burden. On top of the fact, it might take two weeks, three weeks to complete both imaging tests, which delays treatment as well. So uh, I'm a little cynical here, but, excited to see what impact this actually does. But for, for us right now, I don't think we need to worry about it. So when I went through the clinicaltrials.gov uh, website and I sort of explored the various trials, I think it's clear to see what the future holds for radio ligand therapies in the future. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of combination and sequencing trials in CRPC. Uh, so there's a trial comparing lutetium-177 PSMA versus docetaxel. So obviously if that's positive, you're gonna start seeing a greater use of this drug pre-docetaxel. You also see combinations with PARP inhibitors. So that's an interesting combination. And again, these combinations make sense because the mechanism of action of the, the two drugs are very different. And the safety profile of lutetium-177 PSMA is actually very good. And I'm sure you saw that from Evan's slides yesterday. And there's, there's a trial using enzalutamide plus lutetium-177 PSMA versus just enzalutamide alone. And they're combination trials with immunotherapy. So I think over the next few years, we're gonna start getting a better sense of where this fits. We already have the vision trial, which gets the FDA approval. We have the therapy trial, which shows that it's better than cabazitaxel. And then we have all these other ones that I think are really gonna help answer a lot of these questions when it comes to sequencing. What I think is interesting is you're gonna see it moved up in the pre castration resistance space. So in the hormone sensitive space, uh, we're in the process of opening up our phase three trial for patients it's called the PSMA addition trial, where you're using it in patients with a uh, metastatic hormone sensitive disease with pretty much no hormone treatment uh, on board. I think it's less than 30 days of hormonal therapy before. Um, 
And then you're seeing it moved up even earlier being used in patients prior to radical prostatectomy. Could you imagine in a patient with high-risk disease doing this and then going on to prostatectomy? Man, maybe there's a potential that this can sort of clean up a lot of the microscopic disease that we can't see. Uh, and then, you know, the, the ability to create a more durable response becomes real. So I think it's really exciting, uh, but it's something to be aware of. This is uh, one of the cartoons from our Radar 5 article that talks about the various disease states and the transitions that Dr. Crawford talked about. So I just want to take a little time here and think about this. So you look at this and you look at the journey of a prostate cancer patient, and then you think about the impact that PSMA PET is going to have along the patient care journey. So PSMA PET is approved pre-definitive therapy. Patient comes in with localized disease. You think they might have, that they, they have high-risk disease or, or something else that you're worried about METs. You get a PSMA PET. Some of them, many of them, may actually move on to that metastatic M1 categorization much sooner. And then in the rising PSA non-castrate setting, again, you're going to be seeing the use of this over and over. You're going to get patients moved into that advanced prostate cancer space much, much sooner. This non-metastatic CRPC space, which we know doesn't really exist, it's a function of the fact that our imaging isn't good enough to detect it, pretty much is disappearing. And the question of whether or not it's valid, I, you know, it's a very interesting topic. And, you know, Dave is going to speak about that. But clearly, the metastatic hormone-sensitive space is going to get much, much bigger. And to Dave's point, we need to do our best to get patients, not get them to progress to that ERPC, CRPC space. Uh, but if they do, again, we're going to have more treatments available to, to, to treat them. So the role of the urologist, I think, number one, you have to be comfortable with the PSMA PET-CT. Understand what it is, how it can help you from a diagnostic per uh, perspective, and how it helps you from being able to select patients who might benefit from the therapy. Um, it's evolving, but again, it, 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 it's, it's here to stay. Number two, many people in this room have advanced prostate cancer clinics. For those who don't, I think it's really time to think about maybe you should start an advanced prostate cancer clinic uh, because it's going to grow. That population is growing every day, and imaging is going to shift more patients into that population. And if you do have one or are in the process of starting an APC, how are you going to handle these targeted radiotherapies? So if you think about radiopharmaceuticals and prostate cancer, we have radium already, which is sort of kind of in that same bucket. And then we're going to have lutetium-177 PSMA. In the future, we might have actinium-based radiopharmaceuticals or thorium-based radiopharmaceuticals. So I think this, this, air, this general area is going to exist for years to come. And if you do, I would make the argument that there's actually, it's actually very doable. I think the biggest hurdle might be authorized users. You need to find the licensed physician who is licensed to administer the drug. And the two specialties currently where the board certification process includes this are nuclear medicine and uh, radiation oncology. And oftentimes we see a lot of radiation oncologists participate in this and nuclear medicine. And in the end, it's, it's a team effort because we don't have enough nuclear medicine people to treat everyone in the country, nor does Radonc. Radonc so it's, it's a paradigm that's changing, evolving, but it's something to consider. Physical space, it actually doesn't require a ton of physical space. Uh, we've filmed a, one center uh, doing uh, at their own lab, and, and you see their space actually isn't very big. Clinical operations gets a little trickier, but you know everything in ClinOps is tricky, uh, but it's not insurmountable. Radiation safety is relatively simple. You just need the right people, the physicists and whatnot that you can contract to help you with that licensing. I saw Evan's slides and he mentioned you know, the need for, for private bathrooms and things like that. It'd be nice to have a private bathroom. I don't think it's a requirement. You know, I know at Tulane, patients will come in, get assessed, get treated, and get discharged in one hour. So, in one hour, man, if they just void before, you're probably safe. So again, there are ways operationally to make this very not as burdensome on your practice as what you think it might be. And then finally, education. I think it's important because it's, it's rapidly evolving. I think for your own professional education, it's important to stay up on this topic because it's changing. Be comfortable with that change. And number two, patient education. Patients are going to be asking about this. I've never seen something come up recently where patients are so aware and have so many questions. Uh, and obviously, to answer those questions, you'll have to feel comfortable um, knowing uh, the latest. So thank you all for your attention.